Uh, let's welcome in the man, the myth, the legend. I mean, the doc it is Wednesday, and therefore, legend, my friend, join the program. And we're going to break down not only training camp, but some of the stuff we've been talking about the last couple of days that hopefully we can get the doc's answer on. I, hey, I played a little quick nine holes with doc. You know, doc's solid, very underrated golfer. I will say that. Very, very fundamental, ah. very fundamentally sound. Let's please welcome in the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. John Macroon. John, <laughs> welcome to the program. How you doing, my man? Yes, sir, fellas. It's great, man. It's a good time. Uh, enjoyed uh, playing golf with Iafrady. It was great. But my favorite part of the week was nearly giving Booner a heart attack at the <laughs> Rocket Mortgage Classic. I never seen a guy more scared in my life to walk next to professional golfers. It was great. He didn't I understand did it, though. It. I he didn't, didn't understand that you could actually walk behind the golfers. And I, I sent you guys a great picture. You guys can see it if they post it on here. It was great. Booner sitting there in the spot on the second hole, and CBS caught him. You went national, so it was great, man. It was fun because uh, the Rocket Mortgage very gracious, letting local uh, local media out there to cover it. It's really fun, and it was fun to talk golf with Booner and to see how, how all that all shook out. And actually, Booner got to see the winner. I saw the DSP curse lived on in that I saw every shot of the final group. And you saw the winning group, so it was fun to text back and forth, and uh, it was a good time, man. It was the Rocky Mortgage, it, it really. In the end, is underrated. I think it's a great yeah. event locally for people locally to check out the best golfers in the world do their thing. I Doc, I, I appreciate you. Were, you were gracious. You helped me out a ton walking on Sunday, and it were. I think it worked out. Like you were like Booner, you're with me today, and and, and Doc kept saying this. We were walking together, and the Doc kept looking at me, going, "Hey, you're with the DOC." They're not going to say anything to me. And I was like, all right, all right. And after the second hole, I think it worked out. After the second hole, I said, hey, I want to go follow. I'm going to go follow. Like, I wanted to go follow Cam Davis and their group. And we ended up working it to where they were about to go to overtime. We were co we were covering it together. We're texting each other back and forth like, hey, Cam Davis birdie. This, this happened. This happened. And we were helping each other kind of cover the whole thing with those last two groups. And the event is crazy. Like, Shout out to all the people who let us even go and, and, and be credentialed there. It's crazy to do that. I hope next year they get like a hundred more. Like I hope the whole best golfers in the PGA end up at some point coming to Detroit because it's such a good event. It was a great yeah. time though. Shout out the doc, man. It is. Legend. And like I said, man, now it's summertime and get, get out there. I think Michigan has such a plethora of great golf courses, man. It's such a great time to get out there, especially in the summer months, a little hot last couple of days, but still get out there and, have a good time, man. It's great. Enjoying yeah. enjoying some time off before training camp rolls around. But it's been interesting to see free agency with the Pistons and the Red Wings and kind of seeing how these teams are taking shape similarly to the Lions in kind of their free agency mode. Not taking big swings, but really focusing on developing their young talent. So it's been it's been interesting and intriguing to see how everything's going and all these rankings and and kind of the talk about the Lions has been real interesting as well to kind of get a sense of how the national media is viewing the Detroit Lions. Uh, well, Doc, I'll, I'll start it off with this. And I, I'm sorry, I'm going to be a little ignorant here, but uh, Jeff Risden uh, reported that the Lions are not interested in receivers. Uh, agents are telling agents that they're not interested in wide receivers. Sounds very familiar to something that we talked about, John. Yeah, you know, a couple weeks ago, it's weird how that works. But I, I'll I'll throw it to you, John. What are your thoughts on that report? Was that I told you so? Um, no, not to you. Well, and not even to you, Booner. Just in general. Like I, I've been, I, I'm cool. Brad Holmes is cool, so I'm cool. All right. Can't That's wait how to that hit works. you with one. Would you? <laughs> would you make of it, John? And uh, it's it seems like it's on brand, right? Absolutely. I don't know if you guys uh, got a chance. If you have HBO Max. The Giants' uh, hard knocks offseason oh. was off the chains. To see Joe Shane talk about Saquon Barkley, talk about kind of the philosophy of how they're looking at roster construction. Uh, we're going to have a, an opinion piece tomorrow at All Lions just looking at, man, if Brad Holmes was featured on that, he'd be a bigger star than he already is locally. I think nationally when you kind of look at just how bright he is and the way in which he constructs a roster. I don't think that it's really all that much breaking news to indicate that in free agency now they're kind of pausing and not going to look at wide receivers heading into training camp. They do have a couple of individuals at four and five that are competing 
And I think that they have also in Caden Davis and Williams, they have some wide receiver talent that they want to see. So I think that it's pretty clear. You didn't really need a lot of sources to kind of understand that at the wide receiver spot, when Dan Campbell has talked about, it, he's kind of indicated that, look, they're, they're all set there for now, barring any injuries. And I think that the position that they would maybe look at would be along the defensive line or at safety. But I think it's fair. I think it's it's good to hear that agents will come out and say, hey, that you know maybe a, a player that they represented talked to the Lions and they just said we're not in the market right now. But I think the Lions have always been kind of clear and honest when the media has asked them about kind of um, Dan Campbell said, uh, I think one of the last media sessions that he had, he was asked, okay, prior to training camp, what are you looking for? And he said basically shoring up some competition in depth and they did sign – uh, the linebacker Neiman there soon thereafter for some competition and depth there at the linebacker spot. Maybe they do that uh, for the offensive line and at the safety spot if there's a spot available for the Detroit Lions. But there's not going to be big splashes. These are just moves that you would probably look to just have, you know, you don't want to be disrespectful, but just individuals that will be given an opportunity to potentially earn a spot on the practice squad. You don't expect big moves at this point in time uh with this roster at this point the way it's been constructed yeah dog i, I want to ask you this too on the defensive side of the ball you mentioned there um one of the position groups that potentially you could see a trade in the trade market or kind of moves being made of free agents uh the defensive line and we had a discussion uh before the show um and even we talked about it to open the show was the matthew judon situation i don't know if you've seen it just yet but he's been tweeting out all day um that it's essentially he's probably out of new england and, and going to be looking for a different place to go uh, where where do you stand on that? Like kind of two parts to this question, I guess, is is one, do you see it like viable for the Detroit Lions to actually pursue him um, this offseason before training camp or during training camp? And um, if he becomes available to make that trade and do you think that's something that he ends up leaving or do you think he just kind of sticks it out until his contract's up? Yeah, that situation has been wild. What was interesting to read about was Jelani Tavai kind of finding his niche with the Patriots. It always was very intriguing. And I look back, one of my first media questions was to Matt Patricia on Jelani Tavai's first day. And he kind of gave the standard answer. It's like, hey, it's his first day. He's got a long way to go. But he just never really showcased a lot here in Detroit. And it was intriguing when he got the extension. For Judon at 31 years old, I think that maybe – you know, it's something always to look at, but I don't think that at this point when you have Jack Campbell and Derek Barnes who need to take a step forward this year, I think they really do like Agude. I thought that he acclimated very well in terms of what we got a chance to see. I thought he got to the football, showed speed. I think that he's a player that the Detroit Lions really like, and it's really intriguing when you look at it. The the early pre-training camp roster predictions, we did one, uh, the free press did one, and the linebacker spot is real intriguing in regards to do you keep four or five? Does a good day get in the mix? You probably presume that it's going to be Alex Anceloni, um, Malcolm Rodriguez, Derek Barnes, Jack Campbell, a good day in the mix, also competing with Jalen Reeves Maben. So you look at you know four or five linebackers. Uh, on the roster. Does anybody else sneak in? I don't think they need another veteran. Um, but at this point in time, you look at a player of that caliber. He's very talented, but just each with each passing year, you do slow down a little bit, especially at that linebacker spot. I liked his game. I thought that he was a bright spot on a team that has been struggling the last couple years. But uh, I just think that, you know, for him, I, I think that he's more in line with uh, opportunities for, you know, playing time maybe somewhere else because I think the playing time in Detroit – might not be there for someone 31 years old and in, in his position right now. Doc, Judon would come right in. See you later, Davenport. Scoot over. Instantly, yeah. yeah. Instantly, Playing he'll take time. Spot Doc, over. you'd walk in. He, he, he's better than oh, anybody they you're, got. You're, you're, you're booting Davenport before we even get a chance to see him? I yep. wonder if they if, he, if, he <laughs> take the, if he'd take the opportunity to do it. You know, I, I it's interesting when you look at – you know how Brad Holmes operates. I think that they do their research, they do their they do their due diligence, and I do think that if that name would have been starting to circle a little earlier, maybe you could believe it. But I think they do. Like it's interesting. You know, it's it's not like how it is in terms of fantasy booking where we 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 kind of just say, hey, uh, do this. It's not like Madden. You push a button. I think the Lions do their due diligence. They do a lot of research. 
And um, I think that I, I just find it difficult, you know, with how the way the Lions talk about free agency. Like, uh, look, if they did it, it would be great. I think that more competition at different spots is 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 is, is great. And I know people are concerned about Davenport and, and what he's going to bring to the table, but I, I kind of like what Davenport can do. Uh, if he does stay healthy and then also with James Houston as well. So just like with the Red Wings and those that are saying, Hey, why aren't you bringing in more big names? Uh, and like the Tigers say, you don't want to give away time for the young guys. And I think that uh, James Houston is somebody that is somebody that they also like as well. So I don't want to take time away from Barnes or James Houston and taking time from the uh, look 31 years old. Uh, the lines have kind of trended younger in regards to, you know, the way in which the, the roster has been built. So I know everyone loves uh, Tobias Harris at 31 years old and $25 million, <laughs> but my God, you know, I, I like I like the way the roster is constructed right now. I don't think you need to be searching for uh, trades for plus 30 linebackers, even though he, Come he, on, he, Don. For, one year, for one year he could he could do some things, <laughs> but I think they're okay with what they got at their spots right now. Hey, it, it's like uh, the Rams getting old, good old Von Miller. Just come on over here for a year. You know, come, <laughs> on, come on over here for a year. Help us get this bull. Mike, what do you got? Doc, Man. these boys kind of talk about two, it. If it was two years ago, I'd jump all over it. This year, uh, I don't know. That's fair. Doc, the boys talked about it at the beginning of the show, I think. PFF had uh, the Lions defensive line ranked fourth. Is that too high, too low in your opinion, or is that just perfect? It's pretty high, Doc. That is. I was like, whoa, that's a uh, nice, nice ranking there. I know the, the PFF has been, um, you know, throwing out their rankings here and there. I love the fact that they ranked the offensive line number one. Um, the defensive line, look, when you got Aiden Hutchinson, that gives you credibility right away. And I think that when you see a guy that's potentially poised for 15 to 20 sacks and, and, a, and another, um, you know, solid season with all the pressures and everything. That's a good starting point. And then you add DJ reader, which PFF loved. They love the veterans. Uh, they, they love the addition of a player that probably is going to open things up for a lean McNeil. I think the ranking is pretty fair. Um, they do have a lot to prove. They do have to stay healthy, but you look at also, I think a player that is going to be talked about quite a bit. And we, you guys have talked about it. We've written about him is a lean McNeil. I think that he's going to be poised for what I think is going to be a real stellar season. It's real special, a force. I think he's going to continue to be a run stuffer. And then now with DJ Reader taking some attention, maybe you'll also have some opportunities for some 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 great pass rush. And I think he's going to have a great season. And this defensive line, yeah, the question marks are going to be, you know, does Josh Pascal take the next step forward? That'd be great. You know, John Kaminsky is going to battle. Maybe uh, could be somebody that is battling for a job, but is also – an individual that has experience. And then you just, like you guys have said, Davenport is going to be the key. I think if he can stay healthy, now you, you mix and match with him and James Houston and the, and the young talented Makai Wingo. Now you have an opportunity to do some things and mix and match and have guys that can play uh, at multiple different spots. And that's what the Lions love. So Aaron Glenn's got to be happy. And then again, I think the wild card is the, the new defensive line coach, Terrell Williams, is going to get Broderick Martin in better shape. He's going to yep. get him some some opportunities there as well. So you got some young developmental guys as well. So that just is a perfect ranking, I think, right now heading into training camp. Yeah, and, and Doc, another thing I want to ask you, and great job, by the way. I just want to, you know what, we, we got to give Doc some love, like we always do. But you got Jake Bates. Great interview, by the way. I thought, you know, Doc, very professional. Hit his polo on. I mean, Doc, yeah. SI's best, man. And, and it was a great. We broke it down here on the show. And, no no uh, polo tonight, Doc? No <laughs> polo for, for the Doc. But, Doc, I got to ask you. Uh, one, how was how was the interview for you and just getting a, a chance to talk to him? I, I loved his perspective on a lot of things. I know we talk about a lot that there was an adjustment kicking in the NFL. We all understand that. Um, but the way he was talking about how, at the end of the day, he's just – it's just uh, he, it's something that he does for a living and he just lives in the moment um, and he just understands, listen, I just go up there and kick, you know, although the crowd's there and, and he's it's going to be different than 9000, 10,000 people. I understand that. Um, but what do you think of uh, Jake Bates, his, his kind of mentality and uh, your confidence and, and kind of. Yeah, you know, see you later, Michael Badgley. Where are you at with uh, that? No, it, it was fun going back and forth trying to schedule the interview. Um, look, um, I'm somebody that I think is kind of in the mold of being a direct interviewer. And I, I did listen to, I did peek in 
a little to the breakdown and uh I, I it made me laugh one of your commenters said ah i can see why doc wears a cap because he's going bald and <laughs> yes yes i can't I'm not, allowed, I'm not allowed on those videos to wear hats it's professional and look this is you know to be honest right now this is vacation mode for which is always wild to me is that the beat writers kind of like disappear off the face of the earth like they never had like there's no more nfl like they they still do their pieces and stuff like that but they don't interact as much i never i never, i understand it you know we need some time away but i didn't need that much i'm always online at detroit podcast so i wanted to in a way establish you know the lone wolves podcast i've always done lions podcast but i said to myself okay we got this new named podcast that's for si specifically it's called the lone wolves to take up uh take a you know from brad holmes and and saying hey you know i'm kind of somebody that's more direct and right to the point and asking these big bold questions so i said okay i, I like the name i'm one of the lone wolves in the media just doing his thing in my way so i said okay how do you start to distinguish yourself well you kind of need you know, to get a a, a guest that people want to pay attention to. And boy, I was like, I thought the, the response would be great. But obviously, when others write about it, and you guys talk about it, the response has been overwhelmingly positive. And it's the fastest growing podcast I've had. And it's great to see the the response. And, and look, the, the point was simple. It was okay, let's learn about somebody that's new to the roster and had this experience that's just really kind of different than what we've all been used to a kicker that played for uh, a UFL team that had success at Ford field. And when one of your first kicks is a 64 yarder, I wanted to learn more about uh, Jake Bates. And I thought that he, listen, um, and I've told you guys, he was a great guest and the, the best guests are the ones that come in that want to be there and that elaborate and answer the questions directly. And they know how to an look, I asked him a point blank kind of question that, you know, you kind of assume he might skirt around where I said, Hey, was that second year, part of the reason why you came and he said look it, there's a lot of factors and i do think that clearly getting the two-year deal and an opportunity maybe uh maybe kind of knowing what what the, what the situation is being here kicking at ford field that you know his agent said look this is an opportunity you have to go out there and handle business so i thought that if you go check it out it's available everywhere you just type in jake bates you can find it uh you can find it at all lions um, by visiting si.com slash NFL slash Lions is right there in the podcast page. Um, I do think he's got a legitimate chance. He's got the biggest intangible. He's got a big leg and the guy can kick 60 yard field goals. And the number one thing for him is going to be when he's put out there in preseason games and in the, the practice reps, he's got to be consistent. Look, you can have the biggest leg in the world, but if in, um, if in a situation in which you're called upon to kick field goals, you're inconsistent as he kind of was a little bit, towards the end of the year, missing some 45 yarders, uh, you got to be somebody that's going to have to beat out Michael Badgley. So to me, as we speak, even though I interviewed him right now, Badgley's in, in command, he's the incumbent, but Jake Bates has a legitimate chance to beat him out. Look, Riley Patterson beat out Badgley last year. So why can yes, that happen? He did. He's going to be given the opportunity. So when, he, when it's time, it's going to be time to deliver the goods and make your field goals. And it's real simple. When the time comes and you're competing, I mean, they're going to compete. And the, and you guys have been out there. You can see how they do it. They line them up at different spots, 30, 45, 55, 60, and they put them out there in different uh, timed, uh, time drills. And, hey, go at it. Start kicking. And, and, and they monitor each. And we'll be out there each day reporting on clearly one of the biggest battles out there. So as, if Jake Bates wants the job, he's clearly got to go out there and take it. From Michael Badgley, and I do think with with his leg and his confidence, and if he's doing the work now this off season, which we all know he is, then I think the competition is going to be really great and fun to watch, uh, especially in the preseason games and during all the training camp practices. It's coming for his job. We, we are a pro. Yes, for the we job. are a pro. Jake but, Bates. But I'll ask you. Show but, but I'll ask you guys this because you know it's a new era of NFL football with the new kickoff rule. Would you keep two kickers? Would you? potentially say hey okay if he does well maybe you 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 say you got one kicker for the distance 55 to 65 that's jake bates job and everything else is michael badgley's job do you think any opportunities there to be outside the box and keep both or do you say okay if one then one goes on the practice squad uh you look at it and you say it's not out of the realm of possibility to keep two kickers 
But at the same token, uh, I'm curious to see how how the Lions view this, especially if it's close. Like, what do you do if it's close? That's the biggest thing Jake Bates got to do is make this a super tough challenge. You know, I don't think they would keep two, but it's not out of the realm of possibilities. The Lions are unique. Doc, Doc, if it's close, you go Jake. Jake. I was going to say real quick, you're talking Cade McNamara, maybe J.J. McCarthy. We're talking about that. Yeah. You know, We're hey, talking about a higher ceiling here. Where if, if it's close, <laughs> if it's close, hey, Jake maybe. Bates has, is the talent. And, and, and Badgley. Big kick, is, big like, leg. Yeah, you take the talent. Um, Doug, I want to ask you, we had a question yesterday, and, and we talked about it on our show, um, about the Detroit Lions secondary. And I, asked, I posed a question to the guys in the chat. Um, if they thought the Detroit Lions secondary could be a top 10 unit and PFF rate them 11th. Um, and then I, I mentioned that I think by the end of the season with the pieces that they put together, that they'll be in the top 10 by the end of the season, uh, top seven, potentially like they can make that jump. Do you think, and I know there's like some younger pieces on this defense or the secondary, do you think the secondary ends up being the best unit, um, on this defensive side of the ball? And do they like take a step to be a top seven, uh, secondary in the NFL? Yeah, that's the biggest key. I think defensive line, you have a little bit more sure uh, answers there in regards to Aiden Hutchinson and DJ Reader and Lee McNeil. You have more proven in terms of we've seen it for a little bit longer. The secondary has got to get out there right away and start to prove it, man. It's going to be interesting. Carlton Davis has been a guy that hasn't been a true number one but has that talent, so he's going to be given that job. I think he's going to earn it. I think he's the veteran that wants to also prove based on his contract that, hey, I can be potentially, if not here in Detroit, somewhere else, somebody that can be a lockdown corner or do a lot of different things. Listen, Terry and Arnold is somebody that I think is going to have more of an immediate impact. Look, he's going to have his rookie moments. He's going to struggle at times. Look, he's going to get picked on by the NFC North quarterbacks. There's such great talent at wide receiver. It's just tough to limit everything that goes on. And I asked um, one of the safety coaches, I said, look, man, the NFC North has got some stacked wide receivers. It's going to be a challenge. And he said, yeah, look, the, all over the place, all over the league, these wide receivers are coming in from college and, and they're developing and they're able to really do some things just based on how the league is set up. So it's just really tough. But I'm just I think it's going to be a fascinating challenge. I love I love the offseason workout videos of Terry and Arnold. You see him all over the place. His footwork is out of this world. I just think that he's got fundamentally sound techniques. I think he's ready to go and he wants to be a hall of famer. The wild card is going to be Ennis Rakestraw. If he can stay healthy, he's a physical, I think defensive back that can play nickel. He's learning the different responsibilities. I think he's, you know, your first year is always tough because the lions are going to try to play him at multiple spots outside at nickel and at different positions. So he'll have his opportunities, but there'll be a learning curve there. The big thing for him is if he's going to stay healthy, I like him. Robertson, at the nickel spot along with Brian Branch. I think the secondary has more question marks, is more wait and see. I think the unit that you can count on is the safeties. You put Brian Branch with Iffy or Brian Branch with Kirby, I think that safety spot is pretty locked down. They're going to force some turnovers. They're going to be around the ball, clogging up the middle, making things a lot easier. So the secondary has question marks. I think the ranking at 11th that PFF gave was pretty fair, and they'll have an opportunity – with development to get into that top 10 and be productive, but it's going to be, they're going to be tasked with more interceptions, more breakups. And at least at this point, we're all more comfortable smiling a little bit more because it's much better than, uh, than Jerry Jacobs and Cam Sutton. I think the Lions secondary, good job. Kudos to Brad Holmes for revamping it and getting a lot more talent, but uh, Do that, position, that position is super tough to succeed just based on these offenses and whew, it's going to be a challenge, but it's one in which if they are able to meet it, ooh, man, look out. If the defense becomes a strength, I think that these games can be won even more comfortable where, you know, last year there was a lot of grinded out games. Maybe the Lions can be one of those teams that, hey, if, if all if they get rolling, maybe they can beat teams by seven to, 50, uh, seven to 14 points every single week. Do, do you think, Doc, and, and another question I already had, and it fits perfect into kind of what you just said there, but Brian Branch, like you saw the video, like he obviously had that small injury and he was rehabbing, so he wasn't at OTAs in minicamp. Do you think this is like a, a Pro Bowl jump for him this year? Because it seems like everyone's kind of counting on him to do that, and he showed so much. Like he showed a ton last year in, in spurts, and then he obviously had some injuries. Do you think this is a year to where it's like he ends up being one of the best players on, on this defense and one of the best safeties in the entire NFL? Oh, I, I'm hoping. Coming. I'm banking on it. Yeah, listen, it's crazy because let me show you, share my mindset. Um, last year, I approached 
Brian Branch the most, I think, out of any player that was in the locker room. And it's a double-edged sword because I love the fact he was coached by Nick Saban. I'm fond of Nick Saban. I When he was at the draft, I stood there and seeing him on the set with McAfee, I almost was like, whoa, I see the aura of Nick Saban. I almost tried to <laughs> rush the stage and be like, I'm your biggest fan. Nick, thank you for what you did for all these Alabama guys because Detroit is now Alabama, the Detroit Crimson Tide. So you look at it. On the one side, I love that he was coached hard by Nick Saban. On the other side, Nick Saban does not like his players talking to the media. So it was a grind to get information. Like he was super uptight and super serious. I tried to, you know, do as much as I could to get some information out of him, but he was like, boom, like he was ultra business. And it took a like the more times I kept approaching him, the the better it got. So this year, year two, I hope that he can understand that, hey, look. You're somebody that people strongly care about. And he got the seal of approval when Chris Spielman said, wait a minute, slow down, everybody. The talk of Gibbs, the talk of uh, Jamison Williams, wait a minute, pump the brakes. Maybe eventually the best pick that Brad Holmes could have made could be Brian Branch. That was what Chris Spielman said. And why did he say that? I could see it right away why he would say that. All business. The man wants to study. The man understands the game. He made an impactful play his first time out there in prime time against the Chiefs. And the man is uh, – look, if you're going to be tasked with – it's it's no easy feat to just go from nickel cornerback to safety, and everybody's like, yeah, we believe he can do it. And nickel cornerback is not easy. I mean, you got to be you know somebody that reads plays quickly, sure tackler. you got to be a linebacker and a cornerback to play nickel, and he embraces it. So I think Brian Branch – you should levy even higher expectations. Pro Bowl is more of a, you know, popularity kind of thing. I, I I prefer, I think he could be an all pro. I think Brian Branch can be somebody that could be, you know, if he's healthy and does some things, he can also be in the conversation for defensive player of the year. I think that this is a player that you can count on to do the work. He does his homework. He's somebody that cares deeply about his craft. And he came out and said that he felt like he left a lot on the table his rookie year. When you have somebody that kind of has the intangibles and the mindset to be great, I think Brian Branch is exciting. He's not talked about even enough. We should yep. be praising Brian Branch a lot more for the season that he had and what he can do. I think he, you know, man, he could be one of the premier defensive backs in the NFL in a, in a few short years. And uh, we're seeing the fruits of it now. Imagine in a couple of years from now when he's in his prime. Man, I think that uh, Brian Branch, you can't speak highly enough about him. And uh, hope, hopefully, you know, he, he he loosens up a little bit when we get a chance to talk to him. All right, Doc, this is a non-Lions question. You went golfing with our boy Jeff here. I just yeah. need to need to know how the overall experience. And if Doc was starting an article or he was writing an article on Jeff's performance, what yeah. does that article say? Oh, Doc, Jeff, give, the context, you didn't prep, doc listen, give the context, Doc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you didn't you didn't prep your boys. This is good. So here's what happened. Jeff, you know, last week we started talking about, you know, let's golf together, let DSP and crunch time get together. And I said, hell yeah, let's do it. And uh Jeff sent me a message of his swing. And I said, Oh, okay. So I had thought that he was practicing at CJ Barrymore's on that same day. I said, Oh, you're out there. Uh I said, Okay, it looks good. I think you let's uh Let's see about this swing and, and, and get it get it rolling. And I said, you know what? I, it was it's Tuesday, and I said, you know what? I'm not doing much. I want to start this vacation because uh, uh, it's it's a slow time of year. I'm taking a lot more time off, not grinding as much writing. So I said, I said, you know what? Let me see if Jeff's in the area, and let's go out and let's play some golf. And I said, you know what? Nine holes for me at this point suits me so much better. A couple hours, and uh, Jeff got out there. And look, I competed, Doc. I competed. Yeah, let's let, let's just say let's <laughs> just say grit. this. I whooped his ass out there on the on the scorecard, <laughs> but but I'll say this: he was it was more of a practice session for Jeff. He was tinkering. He was trying to see which clubs suit his game better. Whereas I'm already established with with fitted clubs and have used them for a year, so I was pretty comfortable. You know, for me, my game is simple. I can't drive at all. It, I can hit it 250, but it's, I can't tell you how where it's going so my iron play is a lot better chipping is up and down putting is you know average but i can get around a course reasonably 
Jeff was all over the place. Jeff was spraying people. Jeff was hitting old ladies. Like there was a there was one time I had to yell four at the loudest. I could because <laughs> Jeff almost took out four older ladies with one swing. It was oh, so no. bad. He was forty yards off the tee every you know forty yards left off of every drive. But we were working on it. We were trying to you know you know get it out there and and work on it. But listen, Jeff's a gamer. He rebounded. He took counsel. He, he he finished strong. And look, the best part of golf, and that's what keeps us going, and that's why I love playing with Jeff. You know, you, you can tell right away if you can, you know, have a good round with someone. Jeff was into it. He listened. He, he I said, hey, try this, try that. And then, uh, dude, Jeff lined up uh, an eight or nine iron with 100 yards, took it within 20 feet and just launched a beautiful eight iron finishing hole was absolutely stunning. And he finished strong like a champ. So I could definitely play a lot of golf with, um, with I afraid, but you know, for the ladies there, a uh, man look out because he was that, that was scary. I thought he was going to take somebody out with all of the, uh, yeah. with all the wayward drives that were going on, but it was professional. We had a good time. Uh, Sycamore Hills is always nice. And they put us on the right spot where we could kind of, you know, get, get, you could practice. You've seen my drive. Uh, Jeff taped me secretly. I didn't know. I turned around, and there's Jeff take, uh, taking photos of me. And uh, I'm like, you know what? All right, now it's crunch Whoa, time. Whoa, Jeff. Yeah, he, 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 he was trying to, you know, get some content. So I said, okay, guys. I said, I'm going to hit the best drive. I, that was the best drive I think I hit, which yep. was like a 40-yard fade, but that ended up going to the right. So, yeah, yep. and uh, – you know what, I can't Jesse, wait to get out with the doc. Yeah, I cannot yes, wait. It'll be to get a good time. There. You know what, Jesse? What's funny is that I am a shorter guy, and my nephew's like, uh, "Are those pants or shorts that you wear when you're?" You know, I like those longer cargo pants. I like them like that. I don't know why. You know, I, I'm not a fan of the uh, above the knee shorts. I'm gonna. I, I do have them on now, but I, I am more into the uh, cargo pants and things like that. But I had a good time, and uh, listen, it, it definitely was the best. Uh, best way to spend the Tuesday was a couple hours golfing and uh, got my mind off of a lot of nonsense. And uh, look, if that's where Jeff is starting, you know, he's got a ways to go. But at the same token, if he does put in the work and just a couple minor changes, I think his swing will come into form. And, you know, specifically probably using clubs that he's comfortable with and not going experimenting with the doc, trying to figure out what clubs suit him. Yeah, well, you, you know what, you know what, Doc, I, you know what, I appreciate you not throwing me under the bus. I almost, uh, by the way, those old ladies, I almost took off the crunch time polo I was wearing just to avoid the lawsuit purposes. I almost just tried covering the logo. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know who I am. Uh, so yeah, I had a blast. I had a blast with you, Doc. We got to do it again. Uh, but I gotta, I gotta ask you because we we talked about this too. Mark Slareth, uh, stink. He he has his own podcast. And he was talking about the Lions roster, and he was like, oh, the Lions roster stacked. And, and he mentioned Dan Campbell, and I believe it was his co-host or a guest. I, I don't know exactly who it was. But they asked uh, – he asked Mark about Dan Campbell's aggressiveness. And he said he doesn't think he'll change. You know, he thinks that's who he is. And, um, you know, I think he he also mentioned that it gives the players a, a kind of a different mindset on third down, given they know they're going to go for it on fourth down. What would you think of his take – on Dan, and, and even if they do get a kicker, I mean, we can all assume that it's he's always going to be Dan, uh, even with higher expectations to try and win a Super Bowl. Yeah, I think that's, you know, very, listen, the blessing is this offseason is hearing the compliments of the the rest of the NFL world when you see how much praise the Lions have gotten in regards to the way in which they've kind of steadily built. And the NFL lends itself to a two-, three-year rebuild, and it's been fun. I think Detroit sports fans look collectively – to just to take a step back, uh, I just recorded a podcast a couple hours ago and just saying, you know, I think the fans have a little bit of fatigue with all the rebuilds with the Tigers, Wings, and the Pistons, and it's very slow. It's like the trajectory is like this. Like, it, it's 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 fan fatigue. I mean, literally, they, they're making lateral moves with the Red Wings, losing a, uh, an interesting player, gaining a player, and you look at the rest of the teams and you realize, man, Dan Campbell is among the best coaches in town and maybe listen pretty much arguably the best based on his knowledge and experience and what he's got going on and the, the amount of respect that he's garnered nationally has been amazing and you get you know slayer is saying man that roster stacked and it really is when you see it from top to bottom there's so many potential pro bowlers uh you you look at young players that are still very much in the early part of their careers you can name them off at least you know six seven players that have supreme talent. So with Dan Campbell, 
I think that, look, the, he realizes that being aggressive is the pathway to win. And when you have all those offensive weapons, why not? I mean, I think that you see now when you, you – I mean, the, the great part is this year is going to be to analyze who gets the target. I mean, clearly Amon Ra should always be the first choice, but then you have Laporta, who many people, Travis Kelsey's praising, you know, I think going to emerge to be a top two, three uh, tight end, could arguably be the best tight end right now in the National Football League. So why not be aggressive? Go for it. And the thing that he said, which was really, really key, that got me to look and do some more film watching and research was he said that the reason Dan Campbell likes to be aggressive on fourth down is it kind of makes third down pressure a little bit easier. Like you don't exactly have to, you know, execute exactly right. Like if you get it, if it's third and seven and you get five yards, there's no, you know, there's no supreme pressure knowing that, hey, on fourth down, we can pound the ball with David Montgomery. We can do things. So that actually helps the Lions mix and match in terms of play calling on third down. And it really is true. The Lions were able to succeed on third down quite a bit. They moved the football. They moved the chains. And you recognize that, man, with everything they got going on, so many positive things, that this football team, Dan Campbell, should be aggressive. It's the pathway to win. Now, with that said, I think he will be aggressive. But there's going to be times... I think that the interesting discussion and debates could occur this year if Bates is the kicker and you got a kicker that consistently can hit 65 yarders. Would Dan Campbell have gone for it as much if he believed he had a kicker with that strong a leg? If he had, uh, you know, a kicker that was all world last year, would he have done the same thing? It's yet to be determined and we'll see. But I do think it's going to be a high frequency. He's going to be among the most. Uh, one of the most, you know, they're going to go for a, a, a heck of a lot as compared to the rest of the National Football League. But I think that, you know, I think w the best way to put it is I do think there has to be some level of adaptation when the playoffs roll around and points are at a premium. In the regular season, it's a little different than the postseason. The postseason, every point matters. Literally every point matters because momentum can swing just like that, just like you saw. And I think if the Lions had maybe, if you gave, uh, if you gave Dan Campbell some truth serum and some bourbon, uh, and said, "Hey, would you have maybe kicked a field goal?" He probably said, "Yeah, probably one of them. I would have tried it." And uh, because you saw that your kicker had made one, he was in rhythm. He, he might have had a chance to get some more points. So we'll see, and it'll be interesting because those will be probably the big decisions that will decipher how we view Dan Campbell moving forward. Right now, he's a toast of the town. Everybody loves him. And he got the team to the NFC Championship game. But the expectation now is to take it a step further. And one aspect of what I think the Lions can also get better at is if their head coach manages the game. Look, it's not a weakness, but he has to also evolve as a head coach and get better and do more. Like, I don't lower the expectations for Dan Campbell and say, congratulations, you got the Lions to the NFC title game. I think that Dan Campbell, with the right players, the right mix, the right coaching, the right growth himself, can be a coach that can win multiple Super Bowls here in Detroit. He's got that potential. He's got the knowledge. It's just in those split-second moments when you got to decide, take the points or not, you got to be right, and you got to have it where – you can't have your football team collapse the way you get one. Okay, it's your first time. And many people will say, okay, it's the young team and they collapsed. Can't do it again now. The expectation is you understand what you're doing, handle business and deliver what you're supposed to do. That's the that's what you're getting paid for. And the expectation is not to be satisfied with just where he's at. He's got to take it to the next level. And I think he can be, he can be the next Andy Reid. I legitimately believe it, but I hope that it's not a situation in which it's like with Big the Eagles. Statement. I hope it's not a situation where it's like with the Eagles, where uh, uh, the coach there, Reed, took all the heat and, and struggled, and then goes to a situation somewhere else and gets the reaps the rewards. I hope We're, it's here. I hope it's here in Detroit because look, Dan Campbell has it all. He has all the tools. He has it all. The ability to relate to players, X's and O's, knowledge, experience. He's got it all. I'm hoping he puts it together. We're, we're, we're definitely, and I'm, I'm writing it down right now, we're definitely making a quote graphic and posting it all over social media, the doc going. Yeah. Just out, even out of context, he can be the next Andy Reid with the big Dan Campbell. Picture. Yes, yes. I love that, doc. Yes, I love that. I'm, 
people are going to love it too. I've got one last question for you here. Um, I, cause I saw you guys post an article and then you guys put it up on Twitter. Um, I can't remember who it was on your website, who, who wrote it. Uh, but the, the article essentially was just like a breakout player for the Detroit Lions in 2024 in this season. I just want to ask you who you think, if you had to pick one offensive player, one defensive player uh, to break out this season, who would, if you had to put your money on it, who would you pick for that? Yeah, no doubt. Um, I assigned that to Christian, um, looking at some of the offensive and defensive breakout players, just kind of looking at, you know, which players can you count on? Which players can you say, hey, maybe they can do more? Clearly on offense, the player that everybody wants to break out is Jamison Williams. I think that he's got the tools. Everybody knows that he can, you know, play at a high level and is going to be somebody that's going to earn the number two wide receiver spot. I think a player that's underrated is Kyle Raymond. I think that he's a player that can do a lot of different things and can be somebody that can be a reliable number three. Um, you look at it and you say Jameer Gibbs, clearly, but he's got expectations. So you know that he started to break out last year. And he's somebody that I think is going to be very key on the defensive side. That's always interesting in regards to looking at the defense. You know, many people want it to be Jack Campbell and probably that's the fairest statement to make because, you know, in looking at the film, he did have 95 tackles. He was around the football, but I think that he, I can't say it was a bad rookie season. I just don't think that first round talent linebacker was, you know, he didn't meet that level of expectation. But I just think that the Lions put so much on you that, look, it's just real, really tough to be used at different spots, to try and rush the quarterback, to drop back in coverage, play different spots. So Jack Campbell, I think, is the player on defense that everybody expects. But a player also at the same spot and in, in a situation in which you can also see an interview we did. Um, another writer spoke to Alex Anceloni. The linebacker spot, I think Derek Barnes can do more now with his natural spot rushing the passer. I think that for him, being somebody that can, you know, uh, be more comfortable and now a little bit more comfortable in his skin, he's been through it all. He made the big critical mistake in front of the whole world and overcame it. And now I think that once he gained – and at that spot, you get, you know, and I think too when, when you're a linebacker with the Lions – and then they go out and they draft another linebacker in the first round. That kind of maybe shakes your confidence just a little bit, saying, wait a minute, are, are, is my job unsafe? But I think the Lions have showed that, hey, we rely on Derek Barnes. He's an integral part of this defense. And then I do think that his mentoring, uh, his relationship with Alex Anceloni, he's got a big brother who will protect him against the big bad media who talk bad about him. And I think that Derek Barnes has a chance, if he gains that confidence little by little, to just put mistakes behind him and get after it. I think he can be somebody that can gain confidence from a big interception in a playoff game and, and do some things. Yeah. Great, great stuff today, doc. We appreciate you uh, for all lions fans that are looking for a place to not only watch content because we got it here on crunch time, but you could watch and digest whatever John and his crew are writing all lions in the description. You can check it out, show some support there, doc. We appreciate you. We'll catch you next Wednesday. We can't legend to doc. It's going to be a lot of fun, Doc, as we get closer to the season. So thank you, and we'll see you again next week. Let's go on the course. Yes, well, definitely. Some golf, some sports. It's all good, man. Look, and look you, I hope you guys get a chance to take a little time off, too, for the fourth. Have a good Thursday off and enjoy everything going on. And, uh, look, it, this is the best time of year, in my opinion. I think it's, it's a time to reflect, a time to celebrate the United States, drink up, and let's get after it. And, and uh, when you look at it, you know, the ability to see everything going on in Detroit sports. It's amazing. You guys are a big part of it. I can't wait to join you guys next week. Let's go. Happy fourth. Let's Happy go. Fourth, Enjoy your day. Oh, enjoy your weekend. <laughs>